think some of you have gone through this leadership style, uh, but this is the one that I like the, the most. It's very easy. It doesn't have a lot of big words. It just <laughs> simply tell you uh, when to use what, yeah? So uh, we can apply all this uh, leadership style. You see, uh, style would be something that we can learn and can apply. Whereas leadership personality is a different thing. It is in you. And then some of the behavior or the characteristic of, uh, of how you behave as a leader might have to be changed or to be improved. But style you can use, okay? So we are applying the right leadership style for the right uh, situation. But style and personality, sometimes they do merge together and seems to be talking like the same thing, okay? So, so these are the four leadership styles that, uh, that we all use, the total involvement, people orientation, uh, task orientation, and passive involvement. I, I think most of you who are leaders, you, you have gone through this. Now here you find that actually it's just a, a square here, but here is a triangle because in the center, you find that the four uh, quadrant uh, you, will be the main main one. Then you have the two tail end, all right? One is the martyred orientation, the other one is slave involvement. Now I'm gonna share with you these two aspects, very important. These two aspects are sometimes found in our behavior as a leader. So first, uh, very quickly, task orientation. And so task orientation basically has to do with these two, right? Task orientation and martyred orientation. So now you know martyred orientation is an extreme of task orientation. So very quickly, uh, people who use tasks or people who have this personality that is very task oriented, okay? Focuses upon the main goal and primary objective. Now, when do you use that? Especially when you are pioneering a ministry or a church. So when I pioneered uh, uh, with some pastors' uh, faith line, I'm, I was then very focused on the objective. And so I cut off all uh, speaking engagement overseas. I, I did accept some local ones, but I did not uh, travel anymore because that took too much of my time. So I became very focused, task and uh, for the task-oriented leader, joy is uh, in the achievement. And so achiever and uh, uh, the person is an achiever and very success-oriented and very motivated to achieve things, yeah? Uh, and also you find that if you are a task-oriented uh, leader and you are able to do tasks, you are, you are able to pioneer. Chances are that you are a very good uh, pioneer. You can go to a land with no uh, church at all, and you can just launch and start a mission there. And then uh, to a certain extent, God gives you a lot of uh, uh, bravery and courage <laughs> and uh, the gumption, the grit to be able to do the work. So you go where most fear to go. And also because uh, you do need uh, three things, right? Vision, people, finance. Therefore, task-oriented uh, leader tend to be able to see the vision. You see the large picture and you see a very hopeful future. Even now, uh, like this, this afternoon I was counseling and then I was telling this brother, this brother, he is 47 and I'm 67. And he talked like he is like 87 and I am like 27. Because to him, it's like, you know, there's no more future, no hope and all that. And I say, how can that be? For me, it's, like, it's impossible for me not to see hope. Okay. No matter what happened, I can still see hope. Yeah. So it's the go-getter, gung-ho for success, strong determination, never say die kind of a spirit, the attitude. And we make very good entrepreneurs and, of course, uh, trial blazer, uh, which means that no path, we create a path. But the negative trap is that we are workaholics, <laughs> right? And my wife will attest 
to that. <laughs> and uh, tasks sometimes are more important than people. So I'm making adjustment on that, all right? Uh, why this afternoon I stop all my work to counsel because I realized that this brother had a real need. And so I was the one who called him and I was the one who uh, reached out to him because uh, if, if I were not to, then I would be like just doing my work. And uh, uh, just now I said already, I'm a bit merciless to people when compared with uh, accomplishing the primary task. And then uh, when I was a new pastor, uh, I launched a church, the church grew very fast. And that time I began to realize this ne negative threat came up because I was very impatient with people who are quote unquote incompetent. And I could not stand mistakes. And in fact, to a point whereby you'll find that uh, my staff, they were very afraid of me. And they would check, double check, and triple check. I actually have a signboard put up in the office. Check, double check, triple check. <laughs> now I look back with regrets. <laughs> then I had to change it to grace, double grace, triple grace. <laughs> So joy is in the achievement, not in the relationship. So that's, that's where I was wrong. And then tend to manipulate and use people because he thinks that they are dispensable. So people come, people go, you know, and then arrogant and proud if success comes fast and easy. Went through that, you know, uh, mailed the postcard, bought the t-shirt plus the cup. <laughs> yeah, very impatient with mistake. Uh, irritable and unkind and always have this attitude, you know, you either shape up or you shape up. Out. Yeah. But uh, those young pastors who are now serving with me, you don't see me now like that. <laughs> but if you had met me when I was in my 30s, then were you. <laughs> All right. All right. So uh, let's talk about uh, this, the martyr orientation, right? So martyr orientation is the extreme of task, yeah? So uh, this is what happened. Does the task, but shows how much he suffer by doing it. So when people want to do it, pastor, give it to me. And then after that, complain about it and say, oh, look how I suffer. And then still take on, still take on a lot of job. Then tell everybody, oh, I'm suffering, I'm suffering. So he wants everybody to know that he's sacrificing for everyone, working by complaining all the time, calculate the number of sacrifices he has incurred while achieving the task. And so for, for, for us who are task-oriented, we have to be very, very careful because this is the emotive part. This is the emotional part. So if you feel that you are doing this to get some kind of a sympathy, Nothing wrong, you know, to, to share that your job is, 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 is tough and all that. But when it becomes too regular, then you find that you are actually looking for something, right? When you start to look for some kind of a reward, somebody is going to pacify you, somebody is going to be sympathetic and all that. Then uh, you are not leaving because of the, the glory of God and because you are serving God, but then you now... Serve is because you want this kind of a feedback, you know. Oh, poor you, you know, you're working so poor you, like that. And he does not want to stop working because he wants attention. Then he manipulates, sympathizes feeling so as to gain recognition. And then the best part is continue dishing out guilt upon others. See, I'm doing everything, but you all didn't do anything. Sometimes I'm feeling like my mother used to say that, you know, I'm taking care of everything in the house. You all never do anything. <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, never happy with the words of encouragement and all that. Uh, so once you balance it up, it's called total involvement, then you find that you are able to appreciate. Uh, we all need words of encouragement, all of us. Sometimes uh, some of the members, they wrote to me and say, 
you know, thank you, Pastor, for the good sermon. And thank you, Pastor, for the lesson. Or just now, when all of you say nice things to me, I, I, I felt good. But I cannot feed upon that dose, you know. I, I, I cannot be like going out there, oh, give me more, give me more, you know. Something like, like this dog is very, very uh, hungry and very, very thirsty. <laughs> right? So we have to be very careful about that. So markets are bad for business. and Organizational markets are bad for business. This individual may get things done but their attitudes, commands, and general disposition can cause friction among the team. When team members constantly hear about how overburdened they are or how no one else will step in and help, it impacts the morale and production of the team. And this happened in, in the church too. Some people, they will hold on to everything and they don't want to delegate. Okay. And then they complain. You see, I have to do this, I have to do that. I have to clean toilet. I have to do this. <laughs> you know? Yeah. All right. Uh, so we go to passive involvement. Uh, and the extreme of passive involvement is slave involvement. Okay? Means that you can become a slave. And so, so, so this passive involvement, a uh, very nice leader who leave you to do your job. Now, when do you become a passive leader? When all your leaders are very mature, okay? I'm looking forward to the day that I become very passive, that I don't have to be involved in anything, okay? That all of you young pastors are doing the job and that you know how to do. And then uh, does not check your work because he trusts you. Uh, treat everybody as responsible adult. And that's what I pray that it will happen. Yeah, uh, Confident that goals will be accomplished without his involvement. And very good for mature team. In fact, in Singapore, there came a time that I didn't have to worry about all the admin work. I didn't have to worry about the finance. I didn't have to worry about the church education because they were taken over by very qualified pastors and dedicated, you know, and in fact, they, they could have been pastors in their own right, but they served along with me. And amazing, the Bible school was very well run, you know, I did, they just asked me some question and then what I need done and all that. Immediately, they will come up with the details. And I say, wow, you know, I actually work myself out of a job. I have no need to be there, yeah? And then, uh, but the passive uh, involvement, the negative threats is this way. If let's say the, the, the team is not ready yet, and then you quickly go into this passive mode, then no one knows what the leader wants because the leaders can't be found. Maybe uh, if the CEO is always at the golf course and nobody can call him, uh, the couldn't care less attitude, lack of operational information, uh, which means that there's nobody, no second echelon leaders to take over. And if that's the case, like right, right now, I still have to be actively involved. And of course, we have uh, Pastor Karen, you know, we have Pastor uh, Shavi, uh, Pastor Khan, you know, they all come, come in and the other, the other pastors, like now, the young adults, right? I don't really uh, go and find out what happened because it's run by Pastor Elaine. Yeah. And then from time to time, I needed some feedback. Uh, like the Bible study, you know, I didn't have to go and check because it's run by Pastor Ashok. I trust him. Yeah. And then uh, Pastor Danny looked after the children's church. So I didn't need to go and get involved in the details. Right. So, but that doesn't mean that I, I didn't care. Uh, from time to time, I still check. And then when there is a problem, then I step in, yeah. So if let's say the, the people, the leaders under you are not ready, then uh, people may not know, uh, you know, I may not know what the people are doing, uh, jobs may not get accomplished. And then the worst thing is that a passive leader become very indecisive because why? 
because I may not have the right information and I cannot decide. And then up to a certain point, anything goes. So then, and, you know, everybody is doing anything and everything that's right in his or her own eyes. And so in this case, leadership coup is common in this kind of a situation. What do I mean by that is that the second echelon a strong leader most probably will want to take over. And sometimes in the church, in a smaller church, you find the assistant uh, pastor may usurp the authority of the senior pastor. If you find that the senior pastor, you know, like I have uh, heard of a recent case whereby the senior pastor, uh, he used to travel a lot. And then now during the lockdown, he tried to take hold of a church, but the assistant uh, pastor actually uh, took over the church because almost like trying to tell him, we don't need you. When we needed you, you were not here. All right, you were traveling all over, you know, and then now uh, I can handle this. Yeah. And then uh, being passive, you cannot respond to crisis quickly. You lose control or no control. Without the direction, immature team members are lost. People come and serve with you, but after a while, there's no vision, don't know where we are going. They just leave. So organization fails because of the lack of leadership and management. So what I'm saying to you here is that when you are in a pioneering stage and also in a developing stage, you never go into passive involvement. Passive involvement is the last thing you want to do, okay? Uh, unless you really got very, very good leaders working with you. And uh, there's such a thing called passive management by exception. Now, passive management by exception means that avoiding action until mistakes or problem can no longer be ignored. <laughs> All right, the church is going to, the church is losing a lot of members and then, uh, you know, it's like in the Bible whereby uh, some of the Levites were already doing all the wrong things and then the high priest didn't do anything and until God got, got to step in. Now, laser fair kind of a leadership is defined as the absence of leadership altogether. So the first one, passive man, uh, management, means that you are still managing, but you are not, you're unwilling to face the problem. You are Mr. Nice Guy, and there are a lot of crises already in your organization, but you close two eyes and you don't want to see. Okay. All right, so uh, the slave involvement. Okay, this is slave involvement. Yeah, you see the girl is being a slave. So this extreme of the passive involvement, uh, you work passively, you work quietly, but your non-verbal show that you are very sad. <laughs> Express grief instead of joy shows that he is the only one willing to sacrifice quietly all by myself i'm suffering all by myself i'm doing everything all by myself but not complaining but you can see the face is like a sour prune you know yeah and then you get very upset if no one notices the sacrifice <laughs> so it's something like the martyr style the i said the martyr style talk verbally, you know, verbally express. This one is using non-verbal, non-verbal. So if you, do, if you do not notice that he's suffering, then his face become <laughs> worse. <laughs> All right. Tries to do the task without getting help from others. So this kind of leader are not so good in the sense that uh, he doesn't know how to uh, Pass the work on to other people. Delegation is most important. Then after the task, right, he will show extreme weariness, tiredness, <sighs> sighing, <laughs> and then enjoy sympathy. And somebody comes and say, "Oh, you must." <sighs> so, uh, love to give the impression that if he does not do the task, then no one would. But the truth of the matter is that. There are many people who are willing to help. 
And so, especially when uh, you have a large church, yeah, there are many people waiting by the wing there to, to come in. If you only like create the platform and say, please come and help, they will come and help. And then you give them, you know, uh, the job uh, description, uh, what to expect and their responsibility and give them the authority, boom, they will start to do the, the work. Okay, let's go to people orientation. This is very simple. This one is simply that, uh, you know, you're a very friendly guy and you, you believe that friends work better with friends, a strong relationship in the team, friendly environment makes working together fun, workers are treated as friends rather than subordinate, uh, and effective in coordinating mature team, freedom in sharing ideas without fear. Now, this one is something like a passive one, all right? And then this one also means that your team must be highly motivated and very mature and very skillful. In the center, now, watch this. If you're going to take this exam, <laughs> there's an exam. The big question here is how, how your organization is going to grow well in the center, in the center is called the skill level. The skill level of your organization is vital. Which means that like those of you who are in faith line, right? Your skill level got to be very, very good. Like when you teach, you got to be the very best that you can be. You cannot go this half past six style, you know. And therefore, when, when, when people walk with us here, is that I'm not asking you to go and compare yourself with Billy Graham or some others. I am asking you to maximize yourself. That's all, you see. And so your skill level is very important. So from a very, very young age, I realized that for any organization, whether the company that the companies that I used to own, the restaurant that I used to own, all right, the skill level of the chef in the restaurant got to be very good. Means that you've got to cook food that is exceptionally delicious and people want to come back. You see, same in the in, in the church is that your preaching, you must put in 100% effort to prepare your sermon. You cannot like, you know, just dish out something uh, last minute. You have to put in a lot of uh, time into it. And of course, when you come to, to, to my age now and the, the years of experience, that all those years of training and all those years of effort will help you. So now for me to prepare the sermon will be a lot easier than when I was 30 years old, right? So, but still you'll find that the skill level is important, okay? Uh, the negative threat about people-oriented uh, lead leaders is that too focused on people and sometimes miss fulfilling the task. You know, this happy hour kind of a mentality, you know, enjoy, enjoy, be fun, okay, let's have fun, have fun, have fun. Then after when the deadline comes, huh? <laughs> it's not done. So great relationship, but mediocre work. Lots of time spent in building relationship, more fun than work, inward rather than outward looking, in the sense that you know, they form the cliques and then they enjoy each other, but they are not going to fulfill any task outside anything too comfortable, does not have urgency of the task. Okay, now come to this one. This one is the ideal one. It's called total involvement. And this is where I learn how to merge whereby the task orientation and people orientation uh, put a balance there. Okay, so that is total involvement. So it's a good balance between class orientation. Okay, you must get the goal done. And people, you must take care of the people. So concern about the people and the task at hand, using these two styles at the appropriate time. So that let's say, for example, people are having too much happy hour or too much tea break, you know, and then there is a urgent task to be done then I must have the courage to say, hey, come back to work. Let's get this thing done first. Uh, like just now we say, kill it off first. Yeah, kill it off first. Yeah. Then we can go and enjoy. Yeah. So, so here, the very moment I say, hey, come and do the task, then become task 
orientation. Then I say, let's later I can we, we can go and enjoy. That will be people orientation. So we got to communicate the purpose of the team clearly. Because when people are very, very happy, they spend a lot of time talking, talking, talking. And some are talking nonsense, you know, talking about the politics, talking about football, talking about so many other things, except the work. And therefore, as a leader, you've got to communicate the purpose of the team clearly. And then you've got to assign the task accordingly. And also that they should be handed up according to the deadlines. Yeah. Total involvement also means that you share your brain, you share your ideas. But trust me that you cannot allow just, you know, this random kind of an idea. You gather them, you tidy them together, then you put them in order, and then you come up with a common idea. And that common idea must be in line with the goal that you are supposed to have. All right. So creating a sense of well-being by including other team members' ideas. So what we do is that we do brainstorming. Uh, brainstorming has one rule. During brainstorming, everybody can say anything and nobody can shoot it down. You know, means that if I'm going to tell you that, okay, for our church to grow, right, we are going to invite uh, one of the members to dress like a pink elephant to come to church and that will attract all the other kids. No one in that team must shoot that idea down. You must write it down and say, okay, somebody could dress as pink elephant to attract kids. Later on, only in the evaluation, then you start to tick off, all right? Maybe that might be a great idea or that might not be a great idea for that moment. So, but when in brainstorming, everybody's idea must be put on the board or write it down. Nobody start to shoot down because the very moment you shoot one idea down, let's say, for example, I say, let's have this pink elephant stuff. And then you say, no, nah, pastor, your idea is so stupid. This kind of stupid idea. I don't know where you're coming from. You, know? huh? uh, you, 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 you eat laksa or what? You know, you're going crazy. Ah, you see, then I'm discouraged. Then what happens is I'm going to hold back. And so everybody talk and then I'm like hurt already, you know, being hurt already. And so I'm not going to share. So this is very, uh, this is a common mistake that most leaders would do, right? Shoot down some ideas, shoot down. No, let the idea come in first, right? <laughs> shoot all down, then everybody vote. Did you know that uh, Faith Line name uh, did not come because I wake up one day and say we shall call ourselves uh, Faith Line? No. There were a couple of us pastors who sat down and then we proposed names. They were the whole list of names, all kinds of names, you know. And then we vote. And this Faith Line got the highest vote. And so that became the name. Okay, so that is what, what it's all about. Uh, we all work towards total involvement. And uh, you would only uh, be, <laughs> be involved in, in the passive uh, approach, right? When you are about to retire. Huh? <laughs>